Hey, Professor, I got a question about the practice tests. Okay, go for it. So you just added like eight of them. And before it was a, you got extra credit if you got 100s on all the practice tests. Right. So for all those practice tests that are for before where we are now, mm -hmm. do we have to do those to still get the extra credit? No, no, no. These are all just extra, extra. So uh, I'm not grading them in any way. Uh, okay. Also, if I put up a new practice midterm, which I did in one class, and I plan on doing it in all the other classes, uh, that one's not going to count either because basically I only give you credit for the ones for the original tests. Okay, that seems good because I was like, wow, that's a lot of tests. To have to take. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to take it. It's just if you if you feel like you're kind of weak on say chapter one, then I, that frees you up to just take a ta chapter one quiz a couple times. All right. Well, those uh. Those will be accurate to what we should expect on midterm slash tests. Yeah, I, in fact, I'm not going to choose any questions outside of the banks from those. So in principle, okay. you could possibly, if you were diligent enough, see every question that would be on the test. All right. Uh, how large are the banks? Because I feel like they were quite large on the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, each chapter runs uh, concept questions are anywhere from 40 to 80, but the uh, problems are anywhere from... 80 to 125 per chapter. Oh, great. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that's sort of the nature of it. Same thing with uh, statics and dynamics is really, you know, you should be shooting for doing on the order of 50 problems every chapter, bare minimum. So yeah. it kind of helps in that. And, and you'll see is the more, the more you do, the better off you'll get in your subjects, at least these right. types of subjects. <laughs> Yeah, I was just wondering about the grading thing because I'm yeah. counting on those extra credit points. Yeah, everybody would count on those, but yeah, that's not part of it. I wouldn't hold you out of that. <laughs> I'm just trying okay, to help. Okay, cool. Great. All right. All right, thank you. No problem. How's it going, Nathan? Oh, it's going. <laughs> that sounded happy. <laughs> I, I, I'm done with the semester. Um, this is probably my lowest grade, or maybe probability and statistics, but that grade hasn't been posted, nor has the professor had any communication with the class in the last two or three weeks. So Ooh, uh, I have no. Yeah, that's not cool. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm not exactly happy with it. Um, I would I write a once, the, uh, once I'm. Uh, once I'm through with this uh, retake of the midterm, mm -hmm. my grades are up a little bit higher, and I can say, hey, I've got a 94% this and 101% that class, and, uh, 89 or whatever I have in this class. Right. At that time, I can say, I have no idea what my grade is in this class, and if I have anything below an A, I'm going to be extremely frustrated. Yeah, I get you. Now, you're, you're doing good. I wouldn't worry too terribly much about what's going on uh at least in my class uh like i said between the extra credit and the, the lab grade which almost everybody gets a pretty high lab grade unless you just don't show up the lab uh those are really nice buffers students don't do too poorly in here uh and plus i do all those online tests so you got a lot of chance to bring part of your grade up so, and like i said i think your grade's fine but i would definitely uh if you haven't already written the instructor, write them and give them a day to reply. And if they don't, then you need to talk to their dean. Because that's not cool. You can't just like take an online class and not communicate with them for weeks. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I don't like online classes. I mean, I'm also, you know, statistically probably, uh, you know, in the upper uh, age group of mm -hmm. the students that are attending the school but uh, right. so maybe i have a different perspective the first time i went through university there was no such thing as online classes and these pearson homework modules were so unreliable you could answer you know 13 and a half yeah and it would tell you the answer is 13.50 <laughs> oh excuse me <laughs> right so it's come a long way and i still don't like them so right you know. i get you <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that's not cool. Something's happened. Uh, the, somebody needs to know if he's not communicating with you. In fact, you know, we get we get pinged on that. That's one of the things they monitor with our online classes is if we're teaching it. And uh, and 
we don't uh, we don't answer emails within 48 hours say or we don't uh communicate with the student at least once or twice a week uh, they actually sort of demote us and, and put us on a plan of improvement and all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, that's 100% reasonable, especially since, uh, you know, the school is, uh, I know for a fact, getting money from the government for, yeah, yeah. for holding these courses. Yeah, that's part of the accreditation accreditation part process. So, yeah, def I mean, someone needs to know, and I mean, it could be something bad. So maybe something happened to the person and someone needs to check on them. That's so. all and well and good, but when something bad happened to you, you were, you know, on the spot immediately, and then you weren't even unresponsive. Right. You were quick to tell us, like, hey, this is what's going on, and and our, uh, you know, class lecture is going to suffer on Tuesday because of it. Yeah. And you know, that's that's how you approach the situation. You don't approach the situation by going AWOL. Yeah, I'm sorry this happened to you because I know you're a good, hardworking student. Actually, I I get very few students that are not hardworking, but you're definitely one of the hardworking ones that sticks around and asks questions. So I hope it works out better for you. Uh, so uh, yeah, so definitely let their dean know. I, I, if it's in the math department, the dean should be uh, Dr. Abakpe, A-G-B-A-K-P-E. So uh, if you want to contact it, because he's the new dean, and, and by the way, he's swamped. So uh, because he, he's now dean of like three different departments or four different departments or something god awful. And due to my issues, he, he uh, uh, took control of the chair for a little while. while I was having my problems. So he's really swamped. But that, that's definitely the person you need to talk to. His name's Peter. So, all right, guys. Well, we've got four of you in here. I guess we're going to roll with it. So uh, last time we did a uh and and by the way i've set my alarm now it actually goes off to warn me at two minutes till <laughs> so i won't go over class i appreciate you guys being polite and all that stuff but you're perfectly free like i said if i re reach the end of the time you can just leave you don't have to say anything or you can say hey mr younger you're, you're at the end of the time if you say that that's not going to bother me either uh but like i said i just want to apologize for taking up your time so uh let's get started we're in chapter 19 and last time i was working with you on a problem where uh, basically we had taken a chunk of aluminum and uh, stuck it in a container of water. We brought the water to a boil uh, and then left it in there for a long period of time so that the block of metal would actually reach the same temperature as the water. And the way we looked at that temperature versus heat added diagram that your book has for water, what we know is when water reaches at one atmosphere pressure anyways, when water reaches uh, zero degrees Celsius, uh, it goes from ice to a solid and then when it goes from uh at 100 degrees celsius it goes from liquid to steam but it holds the constant temperature all that time so that's one of the ways and one of the reasons people have you boil water to do various things in cooking uh because basically it gives you a long period of time where you know you're going to get 212 degrees fahrenheit or 100 degrees celsius and if you leave the thing in there long enough it's the thing that you're cooking will reach equilibrium with it being a metal, it's definitely going to reach equilibrium a lot quicker. So, you know, usually a minute or two is more than enough. So we do that. We get the metal. It was a chunk of aluminum. Uh, I gave you the mass of it. Uh, I didn't have the specific heat of it on my, off the top of my head, but I think it's 0 0.214 now. Uh, and we take that and we pull it out. Ideally, we would make sure there's no water left on it, but we do that really quickly because we don't want to lose any temperature. And then we drop it in another container, carefully in another container of water that's in a calorimeter. And the calorimeter is made of an aluminum cup and then inside the aluminum cup is a certain amount of water and ideally what we'd have is that calorimeter is isolated from yet another aluminum cup by a little wafer a little cardboard or, or wood disc that of course being just a little wafer it's only got that that little bit of face right there that it can conduct uh, heat through and the rest of it's not touching anything and that wafer actually also causes an air gap that's held between there and doesn't allow conve uh, convection to go on or anything like that. And then finally, you have a lid on top of it with a small hole when you could have your thermometer in there. And you could use a thermometer, for instance, to stir it up to make sure there's no micro bubbles creating and loses some matter and stuff like that. You know, micro bubbles, like if, if something's super hot, it could, in principle, cause a, you know, a band of 40 molecules or something to to get so hot instantly that they come out of uh, liquid form and go into the gaseous form. Uh, but when you do that, then you keep watching it and you watch the 
uh, thermometer go up, 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 up. Maybe it was at 22 degrees Celsius initially, and it will go up, 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 and it'll reach some max, and it will stop going up at that point. And then because it's now at a temperature higher than room temperature, it'll start going back down. Because then the calorimeter, even though it's a really good calorimeter, it still isn't 100% perfect. So some of the heat's being lost to the, the room, which is colder than the, uh, than the actual water and stuff. That peak temperature is when basically the cup of the calorimeter, the water in the calorimeter, and the aluminum uh, block in the calorimeter all re meant, uh, reach the same temperature. And you record that, and you could either predict it or you could record it and then use that to predict the specific heat of aluminum, say. And that's that's a lab we do is, is the one where we uh, determine a specific heat of a material. So anyways, I, I left that up. I got it all set up for you. And it's in the last page of the notes from last time. And we just, I ran out of time because I went like four minutes over by that point. So uh, I left it on there and said you could complete it for extra credit. I haven't made a turn in link for that. But if you if you do do it and you want to turn it in, you can email it to me. I might get you to go ahead and put it in the link, but I'll try to remember to make a link. So thank you all for that. I thought I'd work another problem like that too, because in addition to uh, having heat associated with changing temperature the heat can go into other things so for instance that curve uh that curve that i showed you that was temperature on the vertical axis versus uh uh heat added on the horizontal axis it was supposed to be like for one gram of water so you take and it goes from like negative 10 degrees celsius it rises 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 on on some constant slope until it reaches zero degrees at that point 20 calories has been put in and you keep adding heat, keep adding heat, keep adding heat until you get to 100 calories total. That means the heat of fusion was 80 calories per gram. So because 100 minus 20 is 80. And then from that 100, it starts climbing again because now it's actually all of it's turned to the liquid state and is uh, raising temperature because you're adding more heat, more heat, more heat, more heat until it gets to zero degrees Celsius, or excuse me, 100 degrees Celsius, at which point that's actually at a uh, at I think 200, yeah, it's 200 calories has been done. So another 200 calories will take that gram of water from uh, from just melting where it's all liquid to just getting ready to boil, okay? But then that's not good enough. You've got a heat of vaporization that has to be overcome. And in fact, you go from that 200 calories that you've added to now 740. So that tells you the heat of vaporization for water is 540 calories per gram. Uh, and then you'll ride that out until you finish up putting in the 540 calories, which brings us up to a total of seven, 740. And then it starts off in a uh, uh, diagonal line again. At that point, you're you're raising the temperature of a gas. And gases aren't behaving exactly like uh, like materials do. For instance, when we had delta L is equal to L0 times alpha delta T for the linear expansion, uh, there's only very specific circumstances in which a gas behaves that way. Mainly because if you imagine uh, the volume of any container, if you put gas in it, unless the container is just ginormous and the sample of gas is really small, the gas will just fill up the whole container. So it's, it's volume uh, is not a set thing. So that's that's one of the traits we use for uh, solid liquid and gas. A solid not only has a fixed volume, but it also has a fixed shape. A liquid has a fixed volume, but not a fixed shape. And then a gas has a neither fixed volume nor fixed shape. So anyways, I hope that uh, helps you understand. And I would highly recommend reading chapters 18 and 19. There's a lot of interesting facts that you might have learned once or twice back in your grade school days, but you've almost certainly forgotten, like relative humidity, vapor pressure, uh, stuff like that. The kinetic theory of why we have a heat, heat of fusion, why we have a heat of vaporization. Uh, for instance, one one relevant problem that I heard, and I actually had a, a meteorologist tell us this. So I'm thinking it was true. I haven't double checked it, but it does uh, ring certain or honest to me when I thought about it. But uh, around here we have strawberry festivals, and uh, what happens often when you're growing strawberries is you'll have a a cold night where it'll get below freezing, and that can really damage certain crops. And strawberries are definitely ones that it could damage. So what farmers, strawberry farmers will do when a cold night comes after they've already started uh, planting and, and growing strawberries is they'll spray before it happens. They'll spray the, the actual plants with water. And what will happen is that water sitting on the surface of the strawberry as the air reaches you know, freezing uh, 32 Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, 
it'll actually start to cool down the water, cool down the water, cool down the water, and then it'll freeze the water. And remember, when, you, when you're freezing water, you're going from a state of the molecules being moving around pretty freely to being locked into some sort of a shape or lattice type structure. So that actually gives out a little burst of energy and it actually gives some warmth to the, to the strawberry. And now the strawberry has a nice little icy coat on it. So it can keep it from, uh, help keep it insulated. So that's just some interesting stuff, like I said, that are sort of the concepts and facts that you want to know as, a, as an educated person, period, whether you're in physics, engineering or not. So any questions on that? I kind of have a question about the calories. Is, is that an SI unit? What's the conversion to joules? I got you. Yeah, that's actually at the end of the chapter 19. So that there's a conversion and the conversion is 4.186 joules is equal to one calorie. 4.186 joules is equal to one calorie, but it's more than just a conversion. I, I can talk about it in this order now since you asked about it. So this guy by the name of Joule, J-O-U-L-E, uh, thought that maybe thermal energy and mechanical energy were actually just the same things. They're, they're types of energy. And nobody knew that before. And we had thermal energy, which was associated with the equation like Q equals MC delta T, which tells you if I add an amount of heat Q to a mass M that has a specific heat C, then the change in temperature will be delta T given by Q equals MC delta T. And they use nothing but calories for that. But then, like we did in, in 241, we had kinetic energy plus potential energy plus uh, work in plus uh, uh, or equals work out plus kinetic energy plus potential energy plus E loss, that sort of thing. That's a conservation of energy, but we basically use joules there. And that's historically what was done. We had a unit of joules that we were using for mechanical energy, and we had a unit of calories that we were using for thermal energy. But Joule decided that he thought maybe they should be related and maybe they could be related because at this time they were they were actually before this thinking that that heat was a fluid called the caloric, C-A-L-O-R-I-C. And it would actually, you know, it was a fluid that would flow from one object to another. And it sort of does that, but it's not, it's not a fluid, it's not a liquid or anything. But we do know now that hot objects, in other words, temperature uh, objects whose temperature is higher than another object, once you put it against something, that hot object will lose some of its heat to the cold object until the two reach equilibrium temperature. So that's how that works. Now, now what, what Joule did was Joule took a little uh, axle with a little propeller on it and stuck it in a container of water. And you can imagine it with sprockets and stuff like this to make it make sense. But that axle that the propeller was on had a, say, a sprocket on top. He didn't, he used some other thing, but you can imagine like a little sprocket like you have on a bike and you have a bicycle chain, say, around it, and it runs off to another sprocket. So uh, if this sprocket over here turns, the chain's going to make the propeller turn. And then on that sprocket, you could actually fit another sprocket whose tooth just sort of rolled in between the teeth of the horizontal sprocket like this. So you get a one-to-one -one connection, basically, between two sprockets. Now, the axle of that third sprocket that I just said, you imagine, imagine that having a string wrapped around it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and have a, a big weight hanging from it. So what you do is you release the weight and the weight will fall down. You know its mass. It'll fall down some height H and you know the potential energy change is MGH. And then at the end of it, you check the water temperature and see how much it's changed. And that would take a certain number of calories to change it. So that's how we got the figure that 4.186 joules is equal to one calorie because MGH was equal to MC delta T. And the specific heat for water is, of course, in a liquid state, the specific heat of water is exactly 1.00 calories per gram per Kelvin degree or Celsius degree. So that doesn't really account for energy loss, does it? And also, and thermal energy isn't necessarily the same as kinetic energy or potential energy in that it's not conservative, right? Uh, that's a that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, it's it's still the same thing though. But the the difference is thermal energy is a, what we call a low quality energy. So if you're converting uh, heat or energy into uh, the random kinetic energy of the molecules and atoms in a substance, you're never going to get any of that, uh, all of that back. That in that sense, and then only in that sense, is uh, the two forms of energy not not the same. But in every other way, it's still it's still the same thing that's happening because what we realize energy is internal energy 
is not like what we just derived. Remember, I, I came up with three halves NKT for the average kinetic energy of the molecules or atoms. Well, what that really applies to, what well, applies to everything, but what you're seeing there is the temperature only corresponds to velocity and say left, right direction, velocity in X, uh, in out direction and velocity in up down direction. But if you have something other than a monatomic ideal gas, like you have say hydrogen, which is like H2 or nitrogen, which is like H2 or oxygen, which is like H2, then you have the ability for this to rotate here, but that's just about an atom. So that's that's irrelevant. It's, it's such a small amount of energy to rotate an atom, it's no big deal. But you can rotate it about this axis, which is a big deal, or you can rotate it about this axis, which is a big deal. So that's kinetic energy in the form of one half I omega squared, and there's two ways you can do it. The third was the one like this that you can't do, okay? So instead of just having Vx, Vy, and Vz being the three categories of energy, now you've got Vx, Vy, Vz, and then I, one half I omega squared about the Z axis, and one half I omega squared about the Y axis, say. But in addition to that, that's two more degrees of freedom. In addition to that, you have these two atoms at the end of the bond. They're going to vibrate like this. That's another form of energy that has something squared, like one half kx squared. So all the little one half some number times some quantity squared, each of those types of energy are things that can translate to uh, basically uh, freedom or degrees of freedom within the substance. So when the heat goes in, the heat will turn Vx, Vy, and Vz up. And the equal position theorem says that each of those will get the same amount of energy. But if it's not a diatomic, if it's not a monatomic molecule, it's also going to do three more for a diatomic because it's going to be uh, one for here. So that's four, one for here. So that's five and one for here. So that's six. So for a diatomic molecule, you're going to have six degrees of freedom and only three are related to the temperature. The other three are just related to the internal energy. So that's really what the internal energy of any substance is. And your book uses E with a subscript INT on it. And, and that's good. I like that better than the U terminology. But that's what we're going to learn. So when the heat comes into something, uh, it, it becomes internal energy. And the deal is at that point, you've distributed it evenly to each of the degrees of freedom and the likelihood of you getting exactly that much gas out or exactly that much heat back out of it is impossible. So, and that's the second law of thermodynamics. One of the forms of the second law of thermodynamics that when you convert energy to heat, uh, some of it's going to be lost and you can't do a darn thing about it. Does that make sense, Nathan? Yeah. Is that word for word with the second law of thermodynamics is that you can't do a darn thing about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they use the word damn though. <laughs> and in fact, that's a good point you brought up because we're doing, we're going to do chapter 20. But all I really care that you know of there is that chapter gives you like five or six different versions of the second law of thermodynamics. One of them's somewhat equivalent to what I just said, but another one's like you can never reach zero Kelvin, right? So uh, that's pretty much all I want you to know out of chapter 20. Uh, one definition being the entropy one, which is really important. And you should look over those examples, but I'm not going to ask you to work problems with that because we normally completely skip that uh, in this course. But I, I just don't want anybody ever finishing a physics class without knowing the versions of the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> Zero degrees Kelvin is kind of just like an asymptotal number, right? Like, uh, like the limit is X approaches infinity kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, in principle, you think you can reach it, uh, but in practice, you can't. And in fact, because the second law of thermodynamics is, is literally impossible. And not only that, what, what we originally thought, if you make, make a, a plot of, of, say, volume versus temperature, for every element, every compound, every mixture in existence of gases, if you make a plot of volume versus temperature, they all come down like this at various slopes. But if you trace all those lines back, they all converge at one point on the negative T axis, and that's at negative 273.15, which suggests that since it's hitting the T axis, that suggests that it has zero volume. 
that's a theoretical construct that we know can't happen. Obviously, molecules and atoms have a finite volume by themselves, so you can't really bring them to zero volume. But that's why we don't put the degree mark on Kelvin, because it's an it's an absolute scale. It's a scale that if we met another species, even from, you know, another galaxy, uh, they would almost certainly have a, a temperature system equivalent to our Kelvin. It might not be, you know, 273 degrees below water freezing, uh, but it would still have the equivalent of negative 273 uh, Celsius for the temperature. Okay. It also, by the way, implies that at, at zero Kelvin, you'd have zero molecular activity or molecular motion or atomic motion and quantum mechanics says, no, that's not it. You're always going to have some zero point energy as the bad guy in the first Incredibles movie uh, supposedly tapped for his weapon. I can't remember what the bad guy was. This is a little kid that uh, was friends with the incredible guy, but anyways. So let's get started on this example that I had for you. So the example that I'm going to do this time uh, is not unlike the one that I left for you guys to do last time, except now I'm going to have a change of state going as well. And it's, it's a good Southern problem. Let's put it that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit screen share or share screen because I'm so smart that I remember to do that before I start writing on my tablet, which actually I, I'm not so smart to do that about 70% of the time. But this time I did. Woohoo! Okay. So let's imagine we have we have uh, 5.00 gallons of freshly brewed sweet tea. at T equals 70.0 degrees Celsius. If you wish for only half of the T equals negative 15.0 degrees Celsius ice to melt. How much, how much ice? Whoa, that's what ice with an S. How much ice must be used? OK, so that's our problem. We have five gallons of freshly brewed sweet tea at 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, if you wish for only half of the ice whose temperature is negative 15 degrees Celsius to melt, how much ice must be used? So we're talking you know, a number of grams or something like that. So the solution to this problem goes as follows. So for starters, we need to know the, the mass the mass of five gallons of tea, sweet tea. Now, this is kind of weird, but this is one of the things we often do in physics is, uh, to be honest with you, tea is a uh, very, very small percentage of the material that's in tea, that's in tea. Uh, in fact, water is basically what tea is. Same thing with Coke, same thing with uh, lemonade. They're, they're mostly water. So like on the order of 98% water, maybe even higher. So when we have something like tea or soda or something like that, or pop, as some people call it, uh, then we're basically going to assume that that is water. So what we're going to do is we're going to say 5.00 gallons of water. I think that's a, I, I don't think that's a fair assumption. <laughs> it it might not be, to be honest with you. Once you start putting a lot of sugar in something, that that's a, a bit different. That's a much bigger molecule and it dissolves. So yeah, I, I'd say I'm pretty fair. sure the specific gravity of, of sweet tea might be uh, 1.05. Let's find out. Let's see. What, uh, I know the specific gravity of beer. Uh huh. No, the no, I don't. Specific gravity of beer before it ferments is about. Cool. I'm gonna look up specific gravity of tea. What 
what is it? This is sweet tea. Holy crap, that's a big difference. That's forty percent difference. Forty percent, okay. or point, or four percent. It's 40. It's 1.40 grams per milliliter instead of one gram per milliliter, which is what uh, what water is. So nice catch. I, I always make that assumption, but uh, I never actually looked it up. So that's cool that we've had that now. So uh, I, I'll use that then. I'm going to use 1.40 grams per uh, milliliter instead of that. And uh, we won't worry too much about the 40 grams of tea because we don't really know that specific heat. Uh, so let's go on. We'll, we'll carry on with this. So first off, we need to convert this gallons to liters or milliliters or something. And what we know is that one gallon is equal to 3.784 liters. Nice catch, by the way, uh, Nathan. That was good. So if I multiply these five gallons times 3.784, I think I get 18 point something. I get 18.92 uh, liters. So that's how many liters of water we have, of tea we have, excuse me. So uh, if I say the density of water of, of this tea is 1.40, that's going to present a problem because I got to go look for specific heat of, of tea. Uh, and I let me see if I can even find that. And actually, it's probably more sugar, so specific heat of sweet tea uh how why does unsweetened tea get colder faster than sweet tea i see a lot of stuff specific heat of tea let's see okay so it's one point around 1.66 that's the heat of fusion, though. That can't be it. Oh, no, that's 1.66 joules per gram. So I'll do that. Uh, specific heat of T is equal to 1.66. And I'm just grabbing this off a website. It's a cookingstackexchange.com. And the people that put that in are just nerds like me that know a few things and, and put up stuff. So I'm not necessarily saying this is correct, but it's worth a while to check it. Uh, no, actually, I got this one from HTTP colon slash slash EN dot CNKI dot com dot CN. So I think that might be Canada. But anyways, <laughs> doesn't matter too much. But that's 1.66 joules per gram Celsius degree. And of course, I need to convert that to calories because that's the system we, we're using. And you asked me earlier, uh, 4.186 joules is equal to one calorie. So a calorie is a, actually a larger unit than a joule, about four times bigger. So I'm going to take this uh, 1.66 and divide it by uh, 4.186. And that gives me 0 0.3966 calories per gram celsius degree okay so now i've got that uh and that's for the whole tea it's not just that for the tea part that's actually for the sweet tea so uh and that's why they're telling you that sweet tea gets cooler uh slower than than unsweet tea so we're going to now regroup i'm doing entirely different numbers because nathan called me on an approximation that i was making and, and it would have been 50 percent, nearly 50 percent error so it's probably best that he did call me on it and ask me to check it so we got that. We now have the number of liters of tea there is. And uh, we know that the mass of the tea is equal to the density times the volume of the tea. So this turns out to be 1.40 grams per uh, milliliter times uh, 18,920 uh, milliliters. In other words, I converted the liters to milliliters just to do this. And so 18920 times 1.4 is 26,000. 
488 grams. Okay. So we're looking at 26 kilograms of, uh, which is about 44 pounds, roughly. Actually, it's quite a bit more than that. It's more like 50 pounds of tea. Okay. So we know the stuff that we need to know. What I do with my calorimetry uh, problems, and I recommend you guys do the same thing. A lot of people will say delta Q equals zero, and then they'll write out all the MC delta Ts and all the MLs and all that, and all on one side. And with that, you got to remember, well, is, is the heat of fusion negative or positive? And what about if I'm going the other direction? And I've just found that during tests, I, I sometimes make careless mistakes with that stuff. So what I decided uh, a long time ago when I, when I was a student to do was I put everything that is actually losing heat, in other words, the hotter thing, everything that's losing heat goes on one side and everything that's uh, gaining heat goes on the other side. And then I make sure I never, ever, ever have a negative quantity. So instead of MC delta T, I use what I'd say as Q is equal to MC quotation marks delta T because instead of it, delta always meaning final minus initial. And here I may I use big number minus small number. So with that in mind, I know that the heat is losing. Or excuse me. Go ahead. What's that, Nathan? Oh, I said, why wouldn't you just say the absolute value? Yeah, you can do that too. But I just think it out every time. So, so yeah. Uh, so I'm going to put on the left hand side the thing that's losing heat, and the thing that's losing heat is the T. So I'm going to have uh, 26,488. I'm using way too many sig figs here, but I don't care. Grams of T times the specific heat of T, which we found was 0 0.3966 calories per gram Celsius degree. Notice, remember, I told you that when you have a Celsius degree instead of a degree Celsius, that's from taken from doing a difference in temperatures. OK, now what's going to happen is uh, the T is going to start at 70 and end at zero. That's the whole point is we want all of the T to reach zero degrees uh, because that's a southern thing. We like iced tea. OK, so the bigger number is a 70. So I'm going to do 70.0 degrees Celsius minus zero degrees Celsius. And that's the only thing that's losing heat. Now, the thing that's gaining heat is the ice. Uh, and the mass of the ice is what we're asking for. So the mass of the ice times the heat of fusion of ice, which we found was uh, 80. And actually, we only want half of it to melt. So I'm going to put a one half in front of that. Actually, let me clean this up a little bit. So equals one half of the mass of the ice times 80.0 calories per gram. Notice it doesn't have Celsius degrees or anything in that formula because that one we're using Q equals M times L, where L can be LV, heat of vaporization, LF uh, for heat of fusion, or LS for sub sublimation. But we also have plus the mass of the ice times specific heat of ice, which is actually 0 0.50 uh, calories per gram Celsius degree times. Now, in this case, the ice is going, I mean, the ice is going from negative 15 to zero. So the higher temperature is zero minus negative 15.0 degrees Celsius. Okay. Everybody follow what I did there? So basically half the half the ice is melting. So you're only doing a change in temperature and half the ice is uh, or sorry, you're you're doing a the latent heat of temperature change. Yeah, I'm only doing change. that with just half the ice because what's going to happen is all the ice will reach zero degrees and then the water will continue to reach zero degrees as it, as the ice melts, that water will be zero degrees as long as the tea is, or the ice will continue to cool it down until the tea and the water are all zero degrees. But I only wanted half the ice to disappear, so that's why I put the one half in there. So this is like the theoretical solution, right? It's not like with the uh, insulating jacketed uh, 
system that ice usually actually does where it sits on top and it sits in its own cold water. Yeah, you're sort of ignoring some little surface effects that might actually change it a little bit. Okay. So what I get on the left-hand side is 735,000 off of all the 7.354 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 to the fifth. And the grams canceled out with the grams in the bottom, the Celsius degrees canceled out with the Celsius degrees in the top, and I'm only left with calories on this side. The other side, I'm getting uh, 40, Point zero uh, calories plus uh, point 0.5 times positive 15, which is 7.5 calories, all that times M ice. And now I'm going to put a line here so we don't confuse what happened. Okay. Uh, Actually, I don't know why. I, oh, I, I put the mark in the long spot. Let's do this. <laughs> danger, danger. Like that. Okay. So now I can see that M ice is just going to be 7.354 times 10 to the fifth calories divided by 40. 7.5 calories, uh, and this was actually calories per gram. Sorry about that unit there. So you see the calories cancel out and gives you actually uh, just grams left up on top. So divide this by 47.5, and you get 15. 0.48 times 10 to the 3 grams. So that's 15.48 kilograms. That's a big figure. We got uh, basically what, 26 kilos of tea, 26.5. That's like 58 pounds. And we're adding. Thirty-four point one pounds of sugar. <laughs> I mean, of ice. Excuse me. So fifty-eight point three pounds of tea required uh, thirty-four point one pounds of ice. Actually, we, we, that's a lot better off than the one I did in class. Because the one I did in class, I sort of assumed everything was going to completely melt. And also by using the specific heat of water for tea, that took a lot more heat to change it. Because luckily when you add tea and sugar to the water to make tea, you actually make a substance that's uh, easier to heat up and cool down. Because the sugar is easy to cool off and, and heat up and the tea is probably a little easier. So instead of having uh, one calorie per gram degree Celsius, we got 0.39. Okay. Now, if you wanted to, you could actually figure out how much ice that is, but you got to remember that uh, the density of ice is different from the density of water. So the density of ice is 0 0.917 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. So you could say 15,480. and then divide that by 0.917. Oops, I did, I did 971 by mistake. Uh, 15 point eight divided by 0.917. And that gives me... Shouldn't it just be 15 liters of, of water? Uh, no, the, the I mean it should displace change. the it should displace the tea by by fifteen liters, right? Because right. even the ice that floats, it only displaces as much water as it weighs. 
Yes, but that's because 92 percent of the of the actual ice is below water. I mean, if you stick several ice cubes, it's hard to see that. But what happens is the water level will raise if you sink all the ice cubes because all the ice cubes are stuck together and weighing on one another. But if you just take a single ice cube and stick it in a T, what you'll see, especially if it's a perfect square, you'll see that basically if the ice cube is 10 centimeters tall, only eight centimeters of it will be under under the surface. Again, that's assuming it's water. T would be a slightly different, but that's that's what it is. So uh, really what stays the same is the number of molecules of water. Now, the number of molecules of water is a lot more dense than the number of molecules of ice. You know, ice is one of the weird things that actually expands upon freezing. Most things contract upon freezing. So, well, when you you buy ice, you're buying it by the by the weight. And if you really wanted to figure out how much area it would displace, it would displace exactly as much as it weighed in the liquid that it was in. Right. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. That's that's part of uh, Archimedes' principle and and the the idea that you've probably heard before, where if you take a glass uh, with say one big ice cube in it and then you fill it up with uh, water to the rim, the ice cube is going to float to the top and stick above the rim, but the water will not overflow. And once the ice melts, the water still won't overflow. So this answer came out to be sixteen thousand. 880 milliliters, which is in fact in volume, that'd be 16,000 or 16.9 liters of ice. But luckily, they do sell, sell it in pounds normally, so that's just as good as well. All right, any questions on that? Nathan's brought up a bunch of good points. It's really good, but this is one of those. Uh, it's supposed to be more of a show you how to do the calculation stuff. So, yeah, I, I, I made a lot of assumptions uh, that luckily, you know, he forced me to, to, to acknowledge that it weren't right. So that, that was a good thing. So we ended up going with a, a more correct version, hopefully. Of course, the statistics on tea, I'm sure, varies. I mean, there's really sweet tea and there's hummingbird food. So, <laughs> so all that can vary, but this gives me what I do like is a better calculation, uh, a more realistic calculation. And you brought up all the issues that I think are, are most important about it. So that's good too. So does anybody have any questions on what happened there? All right, so we've done that. Uh, what I wanna do now is I wanna introduce you to the first law of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics is really just conservation of energy. And before you knew of it as uh, kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial plus, let's say, work in is equal to kinetic energy final plus potential energy final plus work out plus E loss. And sometimes that you know, term E loss might have three different terms associated with it. Sometimes the work out might have two terms associated with it. And same thing with the WN. Uh, so that's a conservation of energy. But with the first law of thermodynamics, we're talking specifically a little bit about thermal energy, uh, or mostly about thermal energy, but a little bit about actual mechanical energy as well. So the first law that we use in, in physics anyways, is basically the change in internal energy is equal to Q minus W. So I wanna analyze that a little bit for you first. So internal energy is defined to be the total energy of all the molecules and atoms in the thing that you're studying. So the internal energy of a box of ice cream, okay? If you surveyed all the individual atoms and molecules in the ice cream, uh, you could ask them, you know, how much energy do you have? And they say, oh, well, I've got this kind of uh, kinetic energy. 
uh, due to X motion, I got this kind of kinetic energy due to Y motion. I got this kind of kinetic energy due to Z motion. I also have this kind of kinetic energy due to rotation of my molecule about the X axis. And this for my rotation of molecule about the Y axis. I had this much vibrational energy because these two atoms are vibrating. I got this two from other uh, vibrations, so on and so forth. You get all that down. And then you go to the next atom or molecule, do the same thing, add all of them up. That's what the internal energy of a box of ice cream would be. Okay. Or carton or whatever. So that's what we're thinking about here. Notice, remember, I told you the temperature part is only affected by the velocity in the x direction, the velocity in the y direction, the velocity in the v direction of the molecule or atom. All those other ones go into not increasing the temperature, they go into just inter increasing the internal energy. So let's first think of uh, what all this means. So this internal energy is the internal energy of a thing or a system that you're studying. Now, if you ignore the W, let's, let's assume W is going to be zero for right now. What you see is uh, a Q on the other side. So if I actually add heat to the system, so maybe I take the box of ice cream and stick it on a hot plate, I'm adding heat to the system. So should that Q be positive or negative? positive final temperature is higher than the initial exactly right so the internal energy went up and that's that's the main thing at least with ideal gases temperature is the only thing the internal energy depends on so that by doing that that's allowed us to reach the conclusion crap that's allowed us to reach the conclusion that q is heat added to the system okay now let's forget about the q for a second and let's say what would happen if the system spontaneously started lifting up a piston so you had the system which is a sample of gas say in a cylinder with a piston on top of it and all of a sudden the piston uh started to rise because the gas was expanding okay would that be a decrease or an increase in, in internal energy of the system? The system is doing work on the piston, so it's decreasing the internal energy of the, of the gas. Right. So if you put a positive W in there for that, then that would make it consistent with what you just said. So that means the W is the work done and here's the key part, by the system. Does that make sense? So we got it. You've got to figure that out. If work is being idea. done onto the system, then like, a, like an engine compressing the gas inside of the cylinder is work being done onto the On gas. The system, yes. so it, will, it will increase the temperature of the gas. Or yeah, so that would be a negative amount of work in that case. So that then the negative times the negative makes a positive. Does that make sense, Nathan? Anybody else? Yeah, that'll then that'll lead to ignition of the gasoline air yeah. mixture, right? Yep. Yeah. If it's a diesel, that's exactly what happens if it's a, a regular gas engine though it has to be a spark plug to cause the explosion but just the compression enough is for is all of diesel needs so that's the hard part about uh first law thermodynamics is make wrapping your head around what the terms mean and specifically why that's negatives there because if you had chemistry you'll know that they use the internal energy is equal to q plus w because they're using a different definition of work. They're using the work done on the system as opposed to work done by the system. All right, now we got to talk about very specific processes that occur for us to make sense of thermodynamics. And uh, one of those processes is isothermal. So can anybody guess what an isothermal process is? Is that... Uh... Iso means the same, right? Right. And thermal means temperature. So uh, system where the temperature stays the same. Yep, that's right. So the temperature is constant. Okay. 
Now, what that means in terms of the first law of thermodynamics is that delta E internal is probably constant. We know it is for an ideal gas. Because an ideal gas, the eternal energy, uh, your book will work out. An ideal monatomic gas is three halves NKT or three halves NRT, either one. Okay, but there might be a system that's not an ideal gas that we find uh, the internal energy depends on more than just the temperature. And if that was the case, then we couldn't make this conclusion. I've never run into such a system. Okay, uh, well, I know the rubber band, we have an equation of state for a rubber band, uh, which is kind of nice. And I'm pretty confident that one, that internal energy did not uh, depend just on temperature, but depend on the stretch as well. So that would be a case where the internal energy can still change, even if the temperature stays the same. Does that make sense? So E internal for a monatomic ideal gas is three halves in RT are three halves in KT. And that three looks really bad. I'm writing super small and that's not helping matters. Okay, now ideal monatomic gas means uh, like helium. Helium is a molecule that's happy as it is, is an atom that's happy as it is because it's got an out, outer shell, shell that's full. So helium is also a noble gas. So it's just a single billiard ball type atom bouncing around. If you just go up or down one, for instance, to hit uh, hydrogen, hydrogen's uh, one shy of having a filled outer shell. So hydrogen tends to bond with a, another hydrogen molecule, another hydrogen atom to make a hydrogen molecule, which is diatomic. So in the diatomic case, you have not just Vx, Vy, and Vz as the three one half something times something squared uh, degrees of freedom. In the diatomic case, you can have uh, vibration this way, so that's one more degree of freedom. You can have rotation this way, that's one more degree of freedom. And you can have rotation this way, that's one more degree of freedom. So you got three halves uh, extra. So instead of three halves, you got six halves, which is three NKT or three RT. Okay. So that's what I mean by uh, monatomic versus diatomic. And more complex ones might get seven halves or nine halves. And your book talks about that with a little table towards the end of the chapter. So now back to the, th the processes. So that's one process and what we can glean from it and how we can use it. Another process is if you were to put enough energy into those systems, would the bonds between the uh, the molecules potentially yes. break? Yes, that's that uh, heat of vaporization versus heat of fusion. If it's a solid, you put in the amount that's called the uh, heat of fusion uh, in, and then that's going to break it to a liquid. So then the atoms aren't stuck to each but other. That's just our molecule. That's that's. Those aren't covalent bonds. Those aren't even ionic bonds or anything, right? Those are just, uh, I mean, those are just loose bonds between. Yeah, they're, uh, they can be ionic bonds. Uh, for instance, uh, ionic bonds in water. And, and that's a pretty strong bond. It's not covalent, though. But the, the covalent hydrogen bonds are the ones that really matter. If you put enough energy into to, uh, water vapor, is it? like heat energy is it possible to break the hydrogen bonds yes yes and that's uh that's sort of the mechanism that we think of when we try to make a hydrogen fueled car is we put in water and we break the water up and uh some of it's wasted and comes out as water but some of it's breaking up into individual hydrogen uh which will be h2 and then breaking that we can actually get uh, a certain amount of energy and it's more than the carbon atom gives us Yes, but the uh, hydrocarbons have more hydrogen bonds per liter exactly. per kilogram. Yeah, it's it, it accessible. Like for N carbons, you got two N plus one or two N plus two bonds. So yeah, that's true. 
All right. So isobaric, anybody want to guess that? And I don't, that might have two R's in it. I can't remember. So I apologize if I misspelled that. I know the bar, uh, the, For the pressure uh, the, is insane. Yeah, it's, that's double R, right? So, yeah. So you think this one's constant pressure? I mean, that's what bar means, right? One bar. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it is. It is a, it's a, a process at which uh, the pressure is held constant. With the pressure held constant, what that means is work is just equal to P delta V. Because remember, work is actually equal to the integral of F dot D L. Whoa. And uh, if you talk about just parallel motion, then it becomes the integral of P times A dV. Or excuse me, P times A dL. And of course, ADL is dV, so that's P dV. And if the momentum, if the pressure is a constant, you just get the integral of dV, which is P times delta V. Okay. So that's a ramification of the pressure being constant. It also means that if you're dealing with a gas, you have to use C sub P, which is called the molar specific heat. So molar specific heat means instead of calories per gram per Celsius degree, it'd be calories per mole per Celsius degree. And, uh, and the capital version would be just uh, calories per Celsius degree. Uh, that would make it a, just a, a heat, not a specific heat. Specific means you've div divided it by something. So that's one ramification or two ramifications. Now, the next one is actually an easy term. But they have another name for it that's not easy, and that's the one I like. So, but I want the easy one up there so you can figure out what it is. So, isovolumetric or isochoric, and you can imagine what that is, right? Okay, so with V equals a constant, that means work equals zero, so delta E internal can only be equal to the heat added. Similarly, over here, we could have put delta E internal is equal to Q minus P delta V. I just didn't choose to write it then. Okay, and there's another process called adiabatic. Now this one, you need to know either some Latin or some Greek <laughs> to, to make sense of that. Uh, I am learning Latin currently, but my vocabulary is not large enough to include that word yet. <laughs> so adiabatic actually means uh, Q is equal to zero. In other words, no heat, added or removed. So that means you're using like a calorimeter where you think it's 100% efficient. Or here's the weird thing. Uh, you could talk about the explosion process inside of an internal combustion engine, and that is often uh, adiabatic. And the reason why is because the changes occur so fast Heat can't flow from inside the cylinder to the actual mechanism of the engine. So it's actually an adiabatic process when you're dealing with heat engines often. Okay. Now you can tell it's not perfectly adiabatic because clearly if you touch the, the engine block before you cranked it up, it would be one temperature, probably the ambient temperature. And then after you drove it for several hours, it would be quite hot and would burn you just by touching it. So clearly some energy has left the cylinder over time. Uh, that energy can come from the explosions, but it can also come from other things like, you know, uh, the oil being hot and touching it, uh, parts grinding against each other, all that good stuff. 
So, but that's the main thing with adiabatic is no heat is added or taken away. It's, it's an isolated system from an energy standpoint. So with that in mind, this implies that delta E internal is equal to negative W. So any work you, you put into the gas or into the system is going to go into internal energy. And if you're doing work on the system, we said that was a negative energy. So you get a negative times a negative gives you a positive and therefore the internal energy would increase. So that's a good thing. Now, uh, your book does this derivation and it's really, it's a nice derivation, uh, but with it, it's a little, uh, well, with it, it's, it's a little complicated to do the derivation. So I don't, I don't, I haven't seen much advantage to doing it. I usually do it. There's some videos on my YouTube channel if you want to see it. But basically, the end result is that in addition to P1, V1 over T1, which as long as it's a fixed sample of gas, this, this works. In other words, as long as you don't have any gas escaping so that in the number of moles doesn't change, then you can say P1, V1, T1 over T1 is equal to P2, V2 over T2, okay? So that's always... good if delta n equals zero but with adiabatic you get this other special case which is p1 v1 to the gamma power is equal to p2 v2 to the gamma power and gamma is defined to be that specific heat that constant pressure divided by the specific molar heat at constant volume so both of these are molar That did not turn out very good. Molar specific. Can you can you elaborate on that? Yes. Okay, so uh, we have Q equals M C delta T. That's our normal specific heat. But we can also have Q is equal to N C delta T. That's the molar one. Where N is the number of moles, and this one's just the mass. And this is just the specific heat. Okay. Does that help you a little bit more? I haven't given you any concrete statements about what they are. I'm getting ready to write those down. Again, there's a derivation that you can see it, but uh, I need to separate this from the, uh, from the discussion on adiabatic because this part right here was a ramification of being adiabatic, but this other stuff. I, I so if if Q is equal to zero, why does it matter what Q how Q is defined? If it's always going to be equal to zero, then it doesn't matter how it's defined. Oh right. right. So so those Q equations that I wrote down there are not that's why I tried to draw the box around adiabatic so you wouldn't think I'm confusing those for uh uh for the adiabatic process. So it, yeah, you're right. Adiabatic process, no heat's entering or leaving. But if your system includes two gases, one gas could be delivering heat to the other gas, and that's still adiabatic. So if you have, for instance, so, a so what, what, what's a good example of an adiabatic system? Would it have to be two different gases? Could they be mixed? Is it, it like it two balloons be mixed, connected? Be, uh, anything can give heat to another. Like if you just uh, connect a compressor full of air to one side of a tank and then the other side take a compressor full of oxygen, pure oxygen, and blow it in, they're likely going to come in at very different temperatures. And as long as it happens fast or the walls of the container are insulated, then that's an adiabatic process. At least once the gases because are in that, there, it'll be adiabatic. Because at, at the end of the system, all the heat is, is neutralized? 
well, the heat has been like if the probably the air would be warmer and the oxygen would be colder. So once you fill the tank up, that process from there on out where it's where the valves are closed, that's an adiabatic process because the heat from the air will continue to be distributed amongst the heat from the oxygen, uh, amongst the oxygen molecules until it reaches equilibrium. That's an adiabatic process. Any process. Is there a that, practical example that you can think of? that I might have experienced. The the engine's the best one. And that's strictly because, uh, again, the speed at which you're doing it, heat is, the process of heat flowing from one object to another is very, very slow. So when you compress a, a cylinder of gas and then have an explosion, a bunch of heat is made within the system, which includes the gas and uh, basically the gas and the fire that the spark plug comes in. But as soon as the spark plug fires, it's given off its bit of energy. From there on out, it's just adiabatic because what's going to happen is the explosion is going to push that piston down super, super fast, and heat will not be able to flow from that gas into the walls of the container. So that's an adiabatic process. Another so you're saying even though, Go ahead. So, so the gas fuel mixture, even though temporarily it is heated up, the work that it does on the piston uh, expands the gas so fast that it comes out of the exhaust pipe at basically the same temperature that it went into the intake gap, and therefore it's adiabatic. Pretty close, yeah. Uh, it would obviously okay. deliver some yeah, of that heat. I, I, under, ideal, under ideal conditions, obviously yeah. not under. Yeah, another right. example okay. would All be... Right. There's a, there's a process called free expansion. So if you took a vacuum pump and put it on a... a a crate, a, a steel, a steel crate with no holes in it whatsoever. You took a vacuum pump, sucked all the contents out of it that we can by our technology, and then backfilled it with air. Just stuck some air in it, uh, a small amount, say you know, eighty-four molecules. Now, what's going to happen is that eighty-four molecules is going to go in, and it's going to slowly expand to fill that whole space. That's a, a what we call a free expansion. That's an adiabatic process. And you would make, obviously, you'd want the container, the crate, or whatever I call it, you'd want that ideally to be insulated because as that expansion happens, the gas will cool. And cooling would compel the outer surroundings to add heat to it because anything touching anything else, the hotter object is going to deliver heat to the colder object. So you really need a good insulated container, but that, that free expansion is can be an adiabatic process, for instance. Or you could say... Let's say we have this really fancy metal wall that splits the tank up into two baffles, one of which is a small volume and has a gas in it, and the other side is vacuum. Okay, so you've already sucked all the air and everything out of it. Now, if that uh, wall disappears all of a sudden or maybe busts open, then that's an adiabatic free expansion there as well. Does that help you? Uh, a little bit, I think. Uh, I, mean, I think okay. the more I experience it, the better. I'm also yeah. You'll get a you'll get a lot by reading the examples in the book, and that's I mean that's the bare minimum. What you guys should be doing is make sure you definitely read the examples in the book. Uh, I'm sort of explaining the concepts and giving you ideas of what equations you can use, and, and you're going to see them used in the examples. But we'll also have question time for anything else. Uh, what I want to say now is uh, we've worked on specific heats molar specific heats of ideal gases and it turns out that cp the molar specific heat held at constant pressure minus cv the molar specific heat when volume is held constant is equal to r and that's the ideal gas r 8.314 joules per mole kelvin okay that's the r we're talking about and you can go further and find out that, in fact, this is true. The experiment uh, bears it out. And we also find that CP turns out to be five halves R and CV turns out to be three halves R. All of this is for an ideal gas. Okay. Now, can you think of a reason why CP is higher than CV?
I'll give you a hint. Look at look at the first law of thermodynamics. Is it because pressure is pressure times? I don't know. Who knows? Pressure times volume is obviously equal to joules, right? And, and yeah, the pressure times the change in volume is joules. And energy is conserved, so I don't know. Okay, well, that's cool. Okay, so if you look at internal energy, uh, you can give something internal energy by adding heat, and you can also give something internal energy by doing work on it. Well, if you hold it at constant pressure, you can still do work on it, or it can still do work. So, in fact, Q, the amount of heat, for instance, that can be stolen from an ideal gas, uh, part of that heat given to it or taken away from it can go to the temperature, but the other part can go to work when it's CP. So in fact, it takes more energy to raise the temperature of a gas at constant pressure because not all of the energy is going straight to temperature. Some of it's going to work and some of it can go to other things. Like if it's a diatomic molecule, it's gonna to go to other forms of energy. Uh, you know, the one half I omega squareds and the one half KX squareds and all that stuff. Whereas when you have C at a constant V, it can't do any work. So that's really uh, what you're losing out on. It, it can only go into internal energy, which includes the VX, the VY, the VZ squared, uh, but it also includes the I omega squareds and the KX squareds and all that stuff. Does that make sense? All right. So those are some equations. Another thing I want you to know is that there's uh, there's a heat transfer that occurs. And for instance, heat can flow from one thing to another by conduction. Conduction is when two objects are touching. Notice the DUC sounds a little bit like touch. OK, uh, that's what I used to remember it. So when one thing's touching another, the uh, second law of thermodynamics will tell you that heat flows spontaneously from a hot object to a cold object. It never does the other way around. The first law of thermodynamics doesn't permit that. So for instance, you could stick ice at zero degrees Celsius in 20 degrees Celsius water. And what's gonna happen is the ice is gonna melt and it's gonna, of course, take on heat from the water and the tea is gonna actually cool down or the water is gonna cool down. But conservation of energy does not pre uh, prevent the ice getting colder by giving up its heat and making the tea get hotter or the water get hotter. You could still do that consistent with the first law of thermodynamics because as long as the amount of energy that was given off by the ice is exactly the amount of energy that was absorbed by the liquid, then conservation of energy, first law of thermodynamics is not violated. But the second law of thermodynamics is violated because the second law of thermodynamics, one form says heat spontaneously only flows from a hot object to a cold object. So, that's by conduction, by touching uh, the process by which that happens, conduction. I think it makes perfect sense to you, hopefully. Delta Q over delta T, the amount of heat being delivered from a hot object to a cold object, for instance. Say we have a hot reservoir, and a, and a reservoir basically is just something that's so ginormous that if it loses a little heat, it's not going to change its temperature. Okay. So like uh, if you peed in a pond, obviously the your urine's warmer than the pond water, but the pond's not going to change temperature. So that's a heat reservoir. Okay. Now, if you connected this hot reservoir to a cold reservoir like this, and this side over here was a cold reservoir, T cold, and let's say this surface area here is A and A, and let's say this length right here is L. I think y'all can see, one, we're gonna have a constant of proportionality that depends on what, what the material that rod is made out of. So I'm gonna put K in there. And I think you could say, uh, if you stuck your cold fingertip and stuck it against your girlfriend or wife's cheek, she might find that's cold. But if you took your whole hand uh, and stuck it against her, she might get mad at you because it's going to be really cold. 
right? Or, you know, put it on the small of her back or something like that and it'll chill her out. So I think you can see that the amount of heat per time delivered is directly proportional to the area A, because the larger the area, the more heat that flows. So A is in there. Uh, I think you'd also say more heat flows from either your hand or your finger, doesn't matter if the temperature be uh, between her face and your hand are huge differences. In other words, if, if, her, if her face is 98.6, but your hand is 40, that's going to be a lot more heat flowing than your hand being 96 and her face being 98. So it should be directly proportional to T hot minus T cold. And of course, you've probably seen this in cooking. If you grab a handle of a, of a skillet, a cast iron skillet, uh, eventually that handle gets quite warm, but it takes a little while, even though the pan's already warm and, you know, iron's a pretty good conductor. But because the length of that handle is further away from the fire, it actually takes less heat per time. So this formula should also be inversely proportional to L. So that's the formula we use for conduction. Now, in construction, they talk about the R value, like R13, R21, R19, that sort of thing. Uh, not not with regards to Freon, by the way, this is, this is different. So like in insulation, the pink fiberglass stuff, if your walls are made of two by fours, you use R13 because it's designed to fit in a, a two by four spot and it gives an R value of 13, which is the minimum for code. However, if you build a two by six walled house, then you use R19. And that's because it's built to go into a six inch stud, which is actually five and a quarter, but it's built to do that. And it gives you an R value of 19 instead of 13. Well, the R value is essentially L, L over K. Uh, yep, time's up. Uh, the last equation I wanted you to look at is the Stefan Boltzmann law. And that just says uh, Delta Q over Delta T is equal to the emissivity times the Boltzmann constant times the surface area times T to the fourth. And that's a constant you can look up. The emissivity tells you how efficiently heat is transferred and A is the surface area. So that's all you needed to know. You are free to go. But just to finish that thought, the delta Q equals KA TH minus TC over L. So that's the the thing that gives you how much heat flows, say, through your windows. And uh, when I was talking about the R value, the R19, everybody sees that and says, oh, that's 19. And, and I've seen people do it before. They'll buy R19 and stick it in a two before wall. Turns out when you do that, uh, fiberglass isn't that great of an insulator. The air that fiberglass traps is the good insulator. So R19 is 19 because it's that thick. If you stick R19 in a, in a two by four wall, you're actually going to get less than 13 R value. And in fact, the inspector, if you have an inspector, will fail you for it, make you rip it out, put it back in, uh, put the R13 in. So don't do that. But anyways, that's about all the practical stuff. We've now finished chapter 19 as well. Uh, I want you to have some question uh, and answer time, though. So I don't think I made 19 due this Sunday. So it's not going to be due this Sunday. I'm going to at least change it to a, a Wednesday. Uh, but I might even change it to the following Sunday after Thanksgiving break, in other words. Okay. Uh, keep an eye out for your email. I will be, once I post those practice tests and, and uh, uh, tests for the next two or three chapters, as well as when I post the midterm, I'll email everybody. Y'all have a good one, and I'll wait for the last person to leave. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to stick around and ask me. Thanks for coming, you guys, even though it was such a small fraction of the class. Jack or Robert, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I'm all good. Stepped away for a glass of water. Sorry. No problem. How about you, Robert? You there? All right. We're out of here then. Have a good one, everybody.